Bill Gates speaks on AI agents. Sam Altman tells us what's coming next. Elon Musk does something weird with XAI. And in other news, the first minds to be controlled by generative AI will live inside video games. Microsoft has big plans for generative AI and gaming, and its recent Xbox partnership with InWorld AI is a key example. InWorld focuses on NPCs, non-playable characters, in video games. Figures who populate generalized worlds but have to date largely run on limited scripts. One thing that I really love about AI and this whole thing is that a lot of these video game terms, I think like a lot of people that are that have never in their life paid attention to video games or played them now are forced to learn a lot of these terms from mainstream media, right? CNBC. Here's what an RPG means. Here's what a NPC means. Here's what a GG means. I, I love it. It's it's phenomenal. But the reason I highlight this is because, as I mentioned before, this is where a lot of people are going into. It's easy to dismiss games and AI, that intersection as, oh yeah, it'll improve games a little bit. It'll make them a little bit more immersive. This is much bigger than that. And I think a lot of people are seeing it. A16Z, this massive venture capital fund, they're building out a whole like gaming arm that will be investing in building stuff at the intersection of gaming and AI. They're recruiting Twitch streamers to become their ambassadors. They're building things like AI Town, where each character is controlled by a GPT-4. OpenAI purchased global illumination back in August 16th. As I see it, it's two things. One, it's a lot of great talent. So like the people that are joining OpenAI from global illumination, they're really high level people, but also they built a thing called Biomes. Biomes.gg is the website. Speaking of GG, Biomes.gg is a open source Minecraft clone. So it's massive multiplayer online, MMORPG, and they're going to be adding a lot of like the GPT technology to it, the AI to it. And then not just because it's going to make the game so much more immersive and better, it's also going to allow for training of AI agents. It's also going to generate data for these AI agents. All right, so let's get back to the article. So we've covered the key points. We've covered GG, MMORPG, and NPCs. There'll be a quiz next week. AI NPCs are not just a technological leap, says Kylan Gibbs, chief product officer and co-founder of InWorld AI. They're a paradigm shift for player engagement. Here's InWorld AI. They're apparently in, in Mountain View. So there's Microsoft Silicon Valley campus. There's some Amazon Lab and Googleplex is right there. And then there's Stanford. And then here's Cupertino, where Apple is. So this is like a 10-mile stretch, maybe 20-mile stretch, where everything is, apparently. They have some demos of games that utilize AI for the game. Like, for example, it sounds like here, this little floating robot generates speech with the use of something like GPT-4, or they didn't specify, but it rapidly generates speech on the fly. Back to the article, they're saying better dialogue is just the first step. We're creating the tech that allows NPCs to evolve beyond predefined roles adapt to player behavior, learn from interactions, and contribute to a living, breathable game world. The living game world is, I think, where a lot of people are really excited about that particular thing. While it's fun to have an NPC that can talk about the storyline and their feelings or whatnot, looking at something like this, like this is AI Town, this was part of A16Z, part of their thing, like having a world where people live and make decisions and talk, something that runs autonomously, and you going in there and like experiencing that, that I think will be really exciting to see, especially if it's a massive multiplayer online where a lot of people are in that world trying to push it in the direction that they want it to go. So the world runs independently and you got a bunch of these players trying to go in there and force it to do what they want. Not only is it great for engagement, but also in terms of learning stuff about how humans behave, running simulations, stuff like that, can be very useful for science. Games have before been used to collect certain data that was beneficial for certain research, certain experiments. The other big thing is the opportunity for gaming companies to going from scripted dialogue to dynamic player-driven narratives. We've covered this experiment with generative agents on this channel. The really big thing to understand about why that was so exciting, why that was so impressive is that they told one of those people, one of those NPCs controlled by ChatGPT, they said, organize a party on this date, invite everybody in the town. And that one person went around inviting people. Those other people invited other people. And over a course of whether it was days or weeks or months, everybody figured out who's going, who's not going. They helped set up the party. They all met up there on one particular date. Now, normally, if you wanted to create some event like that in game, each character would have to have been scripted line by line. Here's what they say. And here's what this person says. And then they have to appear here on this date. Here, 
it was done with one prompt. Like, hey, you make this party happen on Valentine's Day. And then the world springs into action to create that all the characters move autonomously by themselves. So think about what that's going to do to the power of these gaming companies to be able to create immersive games. How much easier it is to create something like that, to create just the world and have that world run itself versus having to script every movement. AI will allow gaming companies to create these creative modes, allowing for increased user-generated content and player-driven narratives. So this is June Park. He is the maker of Generative Agents. A16Z created this little meeting and they posted the video online and it got, I mean, very little views, surprisingly. If you're interested, I'd encourage you to watch. It's called Inside AI Town, What AI Can Teach Us About Being Human. If you want to understand where that is going, like what is the next step, what is the next progression, this guy, June Park, I got to say, keep an eye on him. This is a very smart person. And I think he's seeing a little bit beyond what everyone else is seeing. That paper that he did, that was ahead of the curve. I believe that paper was submitted April 7th. So GPT-4 comes out in March. And then less than a month later, he publishes this. It's finished. It's complete. He builds this generative agent memory, this memory stream, retrieved memories. It seems like he's years ahead of everybody else. A few months later, he makes everything open source. So you can try it for yourself. Now, Elon Musk is in the news again, saying that his XAI company, his AI company called XAI, incorporates as a benefit corporation with positive impact goal. So XAI has been organized in Nevada as a for-profit benefit corporation, a structure that allows the company to prioritize having a positive impact on society over its obligations to shareholders. So it looks like a benefit corporation is something that exists for now only in the United States. And deciding to become a benefit corporation is the choice of a company that wants to make a profit while simultaneously addressing social, economical, and environmental needs. Sam Altman posts, what would you like OpenAI to build slash fix in 2024? A lot of people ask for AGI. Yashua Bach says, it would be wonderful to have the option of using an uncastrated version of GPT-4 slash DALL-E with legal and moral responsibility for publicly published output being explicitly delegated from OpenAI to the user. Can you design a contract plus user authentication process that allows this? Which that's a really good idea. I would love to have a uncensored version of GPT-4. I'll take full responsibility for whatever naughty things it says. Myself and a lot of other people are more concerned with this need to change the AI to fit certain political perspectives, certain moral perspectives. Because the question is who gets to control what those morals are, what those ethics are. At the very least, having some sort of a baseline, at least knowing when the outputs have been modified, at least that would be very useful. To have something like that would be, to even have that would be very useful. Here's some common requests that Sam Altman saw and responded to. By the way, a number of people have mentioned that they would like to see them reconcile with Ilias's cover, which I myself am part of that group. I think it would be great if they could find a way to bring the whole team together. Whatever happened between them, this seems like it's more important than whatever those past fights were. Hopefully they'll find a way to bring the team back together. But some of the common requests are AGI. Again, he's saying, mm, we need some time with that. GPT-5, so the next version of GPT, whatever's beyond GPT-4, I mean, it's not really defined what that's going to look like, but certainly people are excited for the next big thing. Better voice mode. I got to say, I was very impressed with the voice mode. If you haven't tried it out, I've used it for brainstorming certain things, and it is very good at that. In ChatGPT, hit the headphones icon. Once that's done loading, hold the button down like this. As long as you hold the button down, it will keep listening to you. Speak at length, explain what you want, and tell it that you want to just kind of brainstorm back and forth. Then let go of the button. It will say it understands. It will kind of speak a little bit about some helpful hints about how to do that. And then you start this back and forth process where you can ask it questions, add ideas, and it kind of summarizes and, and brainstorms for you. The brainstorming thing is what really I found very powerful because you can say, I'm trying to do this. Give me a bunch of different ideas for how could I think about approaching that? And it'll list 20 ideas. And then you can take one and kind of start drilling deeper. So it's very helpful just to get that kind of creative process going. So kind of instead of using the AI to try to get the best perfect answer, use it to kind of spark your own creativity, start the brainstorming process, and maybe get a few new ideas that you would have not thought of on your own. Then we have higher rate limits, better GPTs, better reasoning, control over degree of wokeness slash behavior, the need to tone down that, that preaching, the lecturing. I mean, it's not as bad as some of the other models, but yeah, it would be great to, you know, reduce that quite a bit. 
video, which would be quite interesting to see. Personalization, better browsing, assignment, sign in with OpenAI, and of course, open sourcing some of these models, at the very least GPT 3.5. And then Sam Altman says, we'll keep reading and we will deliver on as much as we can. Plenty of other stuff we are excited about and not mentioned here, which is interesting. What could that be? By the way, when Sam Altman says, what do you want from OpenAI? If you are someone that's building AI applications, this thread might be a worthwhile read because a lot of these ideas, that's what people want. That's what they're asking for. That's what they need. So the question becomes, if you are not OpenAI, are you able to create some of these solutions for them? Here, one person says, access to a model that doesn't avoid conflict or intense topics. They need it for storytelling capabilities, which that's an interesting thing to think about. Oftentimes, some of the best books, they will have maybe darker chapters. If you're writing and you get to that point and you can't use the AI to dig deeper into that story, that's a big stumbling block. Then they mentioned fine-tuning Dali to create consistent characters, etc. So a lot of this is for creators, for writers, people that are creating, whether that's movies or videos or visuals or text, give them more tools to be able to create that. A lot of people are asking for some sort of an email app. So seamlessly sync with my inboxes to learn everything I've written about, how I talk, what my needs are, and just craft draft replies that they can send in mass if they look good. A daily app where you can interact, get feedback on our mental health and goals, daily coaching and idea synthesis, live a better life every day with AI. This is something that I've heard people talk about. I myself have been thinking about it because something that helps you and acts like a coach, like a therapist slash coach, slash to-do list and all in one thing that kind of like, or, or secretary, executive assistant, something like that, that not just coaches you, but also listens and tries to help you plan your day to get more out of it. It seems like something like GPT-4 would be able to do that. Haven't seen any great executions of that yet, but I'm sure some people are already thinking about doing something like that. Bill Gates on his blog talks about AI agents, the future of agents. AI is about to completely change how you use computers. And he believes that sometime in the next five years, these agents will become much more commonplace and change how we work, how we play, how software is created. And of course, we talked a lot about that on this channel. So I'm going to skip a lot of the basics that he talks about. This is meant for a wider audience. He talks about how AI agents will improve healthcare. They will be able to help with administrative tasks, reduce costs. He talks about mental health quite a bit. Today, weekly therapy seems like a luxury but there might be a time in the future where that changes. Next, he talks about education and specifically he mentions Conmigo from Khan Academy. Now, I've been meaning to do something on this subject because it is incredibly interesting. Not Khan Academy itself, although where I think they're moving is fascinating, but we have this huge problem in education. Our education system sucks. The way we teach kids is suboptimal. This isn't some political commentary. It's something that's been known since since the 80s. This is the two sigma problem as it's referred to. You might have heard of it, Bloom's two sigma problem. Basically, this blue dotted line here is kind of like where all students fall on this normal curve, right? You got the A students here, you got kind of your middle average students, and then you got your poor performance here. And so they kind of fall across this sort of curve. And that's your standard classroom, lecture, homework, etc. Week one, we're talking about this. Week two, we're talking about that. So it's sort of a set curriculum, testing, etc. And that's how it is everywhere across the world, going back hundreds of years. You might think, well, this must be the best possible way to teach kids, but it's not. The reality is if we change just one thing, and that is move on to mastery learning, where each child goes, not along with everybody else, but until he hits a point at which he masters that particular subject or that particular lesson, and then he continues. So instead of a set schedule, it's more variable, more tailored to the student. All of a sudden, that curve gets shifted one standard deviation to the right, meaning all of a sudden, most of the kids become A students with then one minor tweak. However, if we take that mastery learning and we add individual one-on-one -on -one tutoring, the results are even more mind-blowing because it moves another standard deviation to the right. And now that average student becomes an A-plus student, and that's across the whole school. It's for everybody. Everybody improves as a result of these two changes. Now, Obviously, the reason we don't do it is because it's harder to do. We have to teach lots of kids. Few people have money for one-on-one -on -one tutoring. You have to fit them in a classroom. They have to show up at the same time. So you can't have different people going through the coursework at different at different speeds. So we teach them more of a like a like a factory setting, right? We get them on the conveyor belt. They work through the lessons. They get tested, and then they go on to the next thing, and then they get the grade. But as you can see by this 
by this chart, that is really inferior to what it could be with just a few minor tweaks if we had the resources to do it. And that's what Khan Academy is trying to do with Khan Amigo, their AI powered one on one AI tutor based off of GPT 4, at least when they were first announced that they were saying they were using GPT 4. And this is something to pay attention to AI and education. I think few people understand what a massive effect that could have. Again, we know how to change our educational approach to get results that are two standard deviations greater than what we currently have. It's just being a little bit more customized, more custom tailored for the student. Custom tailored the schedule at which they learn, have one-on-one -on -one help, which we will be able to do with AI. So this is one of those things that I'm definitely keeping an eye on because if this works, this won't help a little bit. This will help a lot everywhere across the world in every school, university, every kindergarten, etc. More adults might even try to learn something new because it will be much easier, much faster, much better, much more custom tailored to them. He also talks about productivity, entertainment, and shopping, as well as it being a shockwave in the tech industry. So he's talking about how, for example, AI will be able to code really well and AI will replace search sites because they'll be better at finding information and summarizing it for you. And again, Microsoft just keeps gunning for Google, it seems like. They'll replace many e-commerce sites because they'll find the best price for you and won't be restricted to just a few vendors. Businesses that are separate today, search advertising, social networking with advertising, shopping, productivity software will become one business. He talks about some technical challenges as well as privacy and other big tech-related questions. And he ends with this. In the distant future, agents may even force humans to face profound questions about purpose. Imagine that agents become so good that everyone can have a high quality of life without working nearly as much. In a future like that, what would people do with their time? Would anyone still want to get an education when an agent has all the answers? Can you have a safe and thriving society when most people have a lot of free time on their hands? But we're a long way from that point. In the meantime, agents are coming. In the next few years, they will utterly change how we live our lives online and off. Bill, I believe, is one of the people who is talking about reducing the number of days that people work to, let's say, three days a week and having the productivity increase from AI kind of close that gap. JP Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon says something very similar because AI could bring a three and a half day work week. The reason why I think that's important is because right now there's a lot of pushback by certain groups against AI. They're saying AI is dangerous. AI will put you out of a job. And here come people like Bill Gates, JP Dimon, who it seems like are proponents of AI saying that, no, you will work less, you will have more, and you're going to have a lot more time for yourself as a result. And I think to most people out there, that is a much stronger message than the vague threats of AI saying that, hey, you're going to work less, make the same or maybe even more to people who are overworked and struggling. That is kind of a big deal. That's it for me. My name is Wes Roth and thank you for watching.